Good evening and welcome to 16 by 9. On May 9, 1992, a deadly explosion ripped through the Westray coal mine in Plymouth, Nova Scotia, killing 26 miners. Lack safety conditions were blamed for the tragedy, triggering tough new laws and promises it would never happen again. Fast forward 24 years and another coal mine is about to open in Nova Scotia. It brings the promise of much needed jobs. But as Gil Shohat explains, the mine also brings back bad memories and concerns about the safety record of the American coal baron who's behind it. The soil of this place is pretty much my ancestors. I, I mean, the graveyards that, that lay at the top of our mountains are, that's my ancestors that lay, lay in those graveyards. My family initially settled this valley during the forced removal of the Cherokee. Uh, the women and children in my family followed the rivers to their headwaters. My family has been in this valley since the 1700s. Maria Gano's people have known these mountains, ravines, and ridges for generations. My grandfather's full blood Cherokee. Uh, he didn't talk a whole lot, but when he did, people listened. <laughs> and they upset him. Uh, my grandfather spent his last days worried about what they was going to do here. Maria says everything changed in 2000 when a mining company came onto her land and wanted access to a piece of her property. And it all washed away with Chris Klein's mess. They planned to build a strip mine behind the family's hollow. And that worried her grandfather. Me and men didn't come in here for nothing, he said. They come in here for a reason. He said, he called me sissy. He goes, sissy, I don't know what's going on. He said, but it's going to be a hard fight if they come in here on you. Maria was determined to keep all her land, and that's when her battle began. I ain't afraid of nothing. And uh, I told him, I said, there's nothing here for sale, nothing. And they ain't, there's nothing here for sale. You can't put a price on but Maria couldn't stop the man from going around and working the land behind her home. Their prize was the coal buried near the top of the mountain. Like in other places in West Virginia, they stripped the hills bare and brought heavy machines that ripped tons of earth off the land and pushed it into the valley. They also built ponds meant to hold back the debris. Those ponds failed. We got a four inch rainfall and it nearly washed me and my children away. Maria Gano uh, was supposed to be protected. She was downstream. Jack Spadaro, once a top U.S. government mine safety official, is now a critic of the industry. When the water hit that uh, slope of that fill, it just washed everything out, uh, destroyed Maria's barn, almost uh, destroyed her house. Maria says her land was left befouled and polluted. Where is the prosperity that was promised from all of this. She blames this man who built the mine for destroying her property. His name is Chris Klein, a coal magnate who's been dubbed the king of coal. Klein made some of his money by leveling mountaintops to heaps of gravel and extracting the coal inside. Maria sued the coal company that ran the mine behind her hollow. Chris Klein promised his employees and our county prosperity from his mining operation. There is no prosperity, nothing but poverty and, and anguish and broken bodies and poisoned land. In fact, his mine violated the law while it was in operation. Spadaro testified for Maria in her case against the coal company. The true cost is being borne by people like Maria Gano downstream. The company denied responsibility, saying they conduct their mining business in accordance with all applicable laws and regulations. Maria's case was settled out of court years later. Klein eventually sold the mine. Years after that sale, the land is still being reclaimed. Maria says she can't drink her well water because of the waste released by the mine. The groundwater especially has been contaminated by this mine drainage. In the hills and hollows of West Virginia, 
Poverty is a disease that goes back generations. Well-paying coal jobs were always the cure. The need for jobs is overriding the kind of uh, caution that one should have in mining in certain areas. That gave coal bosses enormous leverage. Coal barons have been around since God was a boy. In the 1990s, David McAteer was America's top mining inspector, running MSHA, the Mine Safety and Health Administration. His job was to make sure those barons followed the rules and did not abuse their power. Typically, it's a one-horse economy, and that one-horse economy leads to people sort of getting an attitude that they can, in fact, operate uh, in the fashion that they that they like to. Uh, and since they're driving the jobs in these in these communities, uh, they can get away with that. One coal boss that David kept a close eye on in the 1990s was Chris Klein. They operated close to the margin. Uh, they pushed the envelope. They they uh, ran an understaffed capacity uh, in order to um, make their economics go right. According to critics, Klein kept pushing that envelope in the 2000s when he relocated much of his coal operation from West Virginia to Illinois. There were a number of accidents which suggest uh, that in fact uh, they were not taking care of prevention steps, uh, steps to avoid accidents and spending the money that you need to spend on prevention. Coal mining is a dangerous job and coal miners know what can happen when safety is ignored. The accidents don't occur to the operator, the accident occurred to the miner. The key was for mine owners to follow the rules. And the men can come home safely if everything is done right, but you better make sure everything is done right. And that's no shortcuts. There's no shortcuts in mining. Ellen Smith has spent almost 30 years looking at coal mine safety. She's documented many tragedies that happen when things go wrong. This business is deadly serious. Everybody's dead. When you have explosions of this size, it literally sucks the air out of their lungs. These miners aren't going to survive. Coal contains methane, and when you cut up coal, it releases two things, methane and coal dust. It's an explosive mix. It can blow up and does. And you, you must anticipate that it's going to, and you must plan for it. To mitigate these risks, the government wrote safety standards, things that companies linked to Klein didn't always follow. We hired Smith to look at the safety of some of Klein's mines in Illinois. Mr. Klein has a mix of mines, but what's troubling is he has one in particular that is um, incredibly unsafe. Smith analyzed violations for one of his mines, MC1. The U.S. government fined that mine over $1.6 million in one year alone. The company is contesting some of those fines. Still, when Ellen looked at things, she didn't like what she saw. Couldn't pay me enough, I wouldn't go in that mine. You don't have your firefighting equipment in place, and you don't have your ventilation, and you've got float coal dust, you're gonna have a mine disaster, right? It's the perfect storm. Next, warning Canada about the coal baron coming to town. Well, they need to know that, that Chris Klein's gonna tell them anything to get in there and start operating. But I believe I'd have a full-time crew on him making sure he obeyed the laws. Thousands of feet in the air, it's easy to see how industry has replaced nature. Do the turn over this one? Yeah. The forest is broken by machines and geometry. Yeah, these are 
To get to lucrative coal seams, companies bulldoze the tops of these hills. In some cases, that's meant polluted streams and flooded land. It's just not the way that you do business. Kills the land, kills the water, kills the people too. Maria Gano blames coal magnates like Chris Klein for destroying mountains near her land. She's lived with the consequences of mountaintop removal mining and is now fighting to save these hills. But even Maria recognizes that coal means jobs in poor places like here in Appalachia. My son is coal miner. Uh, my father was coal miner. I have two brothers that, that was coal miners. Um, I have women in my family that were coal miners. They love this place and they need to make a living. Uh, so they, they will work in these mines. 2,500 kilometers north of Maria's land, in Cape Breton, there's another coal seam and another community just as desperate. We're, we're, we are craving for jobs in Cape Breton, craving for it. What Gordy Peckham is talking about is a new coal mine being set up by Chris Klein, the West Virginia coal baron. This is something big, this Donka mine. This year, and sometime in 16, it was supposed to be up to 100. 100 jobs, 100 jobs is big in Cape Breton. Klein is coming here to run a mine at Donkin in Cape Breton. It will bring about 120 jobs to the area. Jobs for men like Gordy, who applied for work at the Donkin mine. I want a job close to home, where I'm not traveling and away from my family. Now you can see it's abandoned. Everything's covered in, grass grown in. This was one of the mines Gordy worked at. Gordy lost his job at another coal mine when it closed about 15 years ago. By 2001, Cape Breton's last underground coal mine shut down. And this mine would go run this way from the top of that hill, because your tunnel would be there, and she'd run right in through here. And there's your ocean. Like a lot of men in Cape Breton, he has to fly to the oil sands in Alberta for work. Tough. It's tough being away. It's nice when it's over. You're back, but you got that thinking, when am I going back again? Gordy got his first job in the coal pit at 19. Back memories, this place. Just down the street from his house. Big time memories. It was all good memories, though. All good. Coal was a heart that pumped the economy here. And coal was synonymous with prosperity. That's me, 1990, 91. And it was booming. I loved it. It was an everyday thing for me. I loved it. And now they're starting it all over again at Duncan. In the 1960s, there were 10,000 men working in coal and steel on the island. But prosperity came at a heavy cost. I worked with him. Kevin Young worked with him. Vincey Campbell, remember him, worked with him. Alec McClellan worked with him. In Nova Scotia, thousands of miners died from black lung disease in brutal accidents and explosions. Conditions inside the mine are terrible. Then in 1992, deep below the community of Plymouth, Nova Scotia, the West Ray mine exploded, killing 26 miners. It was the news no one wanted to hear. Our deepest sympathy goes out to the families at this tragic, tragic time. It was a disaster that shook the province and reverberated throughout the country. Family members were informed of their losses by company officials and RCMP. People demanded answers, and the provincial government launched an inquiry. Today, Nova Scotia Premier Don Cameron, whose riding includes the West Ray mine, said he too was devastated by the loss. That inquiry found the company acted recklessly, displaying arrogance and cynicism, relentlessly pushing production over safety. And like so many disasters before West Ray, it said the 26 deaths were preventable. And on behalf of the province of Nova Scotia, I officially apologize for any role government may have played. As a government and as a fellow Nova Scotian, we are deeply sorry for the West Ray disaster. It should never have happened. And while we can't change the past, we can change and will influence the future. What the government said there in their report on West Ray 
is that this was preventable. If you apply good mining principles, you could prevent it. Knowing what you know about the Klein operation now and the Donkin operation, how worried are you of another West Ray? The fact that there have been 92 violations for one mine in two years for that same kind of basic maintenance problem, coal dust, suggests one ought to be concerned. We asked the Nova Scotia government whether they are concerned about Chris Klein and the Donkin mine. We have to get these workers home safety. That's paramount for us. The provincial minister of transportation, Jeff McClellan, is the point man on many issues related to the mine. We can't shirk uh, any of the rules. We're not going to bend anything in, in any respect whatsoever. We've got to know that the Donkin mine is safe. Uh, that's our focus. The government hired a consulting company to look at the mines linked to Klein. 16 by 9 obtained an exclusive copy of that report. Its conclusion, quote, Klein Group appears to be a reasonably good candidate for successfully developing, then safely and efficiently operating the proposed Donkin project. But Smith says the report didn't focus enough on Klein's worst violations, and for Smith, that made for a very flawed review. That is not due diligence. If I'm an insurance company and I want a due diligence report, darn straight, I want to know the worst. I want to know what they did because I'm going to ask questions. I can honestly say I don't think proper due diligence was done in this case. Maria feels like she's seen all this before. Well, they need to know that, that Chris Klein's going to tell them anything to get in there and start operating. And once he gets in there and starts operating, <laughs> they're going to regret it. Because, I mean, he, uh, he'll do anything to get his foot in the door. And when he gets in the f his foot in the door, everybody step out of the way, because he's going to do what he wants. He might obey the laws, or he might seem like he's going to obey the laws. But I believe I'd have a full-time crew on him making sure he obeyed the laws. Klein's company is bringing a team of people to Cape Breton to help manage the Donkin mine. 16 by 9 learned one of those people is this man, Chris Blanchard. Blanchard has a questionable history of his own. Chris Blanchard ignored the federal standards over and over and over again, not just once or twice, but hundreds of times. More than 24 hours after the accident at the Upper Big Branch Mine. Before he worked for Klein's company, Blanchard was president of the Upper Big Branch Mine in West Virginia. In 2010, that mine exploded, killing 29 miners. In that mine, the coal dust was not collected and removed from the mine. And that's what caused that incredibly powerful explosion. Train rails that go back in look like they've been twisted like a pretzel. McAteer was appointed to investigate that explosion. It blew up with such force that when we investigated underground there, the, the, the level of forces was something I'd never seen. He would tell them that he needed to shut down the shift for the safety of his men. Judy Peterson's brother worked at Upper Big Branch. Through the power of intimidation, they could, they could ask him to do things that he did not feel that was in the best interest of the people under his care. He was one of the 29 miners who died at the Upper Big Branch explosion. What was a rescue mission had officially become a recovery operation. My brother's body was mangled in such a way that I did not recognize him. Every single bone was crushed. That's what they gave us back. Chris Blanchard is the person who was most responsible for that blow up because he continued operating that mine in an unsafe manner, even though he had been re warned repeatedly. Chris Blanchard cut a deal and was never charged in relation to the Upper Big Branch disaster. His boss in that case is facing a year in prison. During the trial, Blanchard denied breaking the law, but admitted his company was cited for hundreds of violations, most of which were preventable. Does the name Chris Blanchard mean anything to you? Uh, yes. You met him? I have, yep. Who is he? Um, one of the many Klein representatives that uh, I've come across in the, I guess, couple of years now that they've been here on the ground in Cape Breton. 
Do you know his background? Uh, yes, I've, I've obviously read uh, some of the, the things that have been online about him. Uh, read that he was part of, uh, he was a mine manager, had a role with uh, an explosion in the U.S. The Upper Big Branch explosion. Okay. Do you know what his role was? I don't. Part of his role was he was in charge of ventilation. Okay. Is it a problem for you that somebody that was involved with ventilation at Upper Big Branch, and one of the reasons the mine exploded was because the ventilation wasn't working properly. Right. Um, look, I, I don't know what his role is on, on the ventilation conversations. I don't know what his role is whatsoever at Duncan Mine at this point. Um, I have to trust the, the, the system we have in place and the mechanism for ensuring that safety. We went back to the government of Nova Scotia, but they wouldn't tell us what Blanchard's role is at the Duncan Mine. They did tell us that he is not involved in day-to-day -day operations. We reached out to Chris Blanchard, but never heard back. So we went back to the man who owns the mine, Chris Klein, to ask about his safety record and about Blanchard. Klein denied our interview request. Then, just days later, Blanchard resigned. This mine has been approved, right? So my question would be, what are you going to do to make sure you do not have the violations in that mine that we see here in the US. So we went back again to the government to put that question to them about Chris Klein's safety record. There will be no mining at Duncan until it can be done safely. Perhaps, but Minister of Labor Kelly Regan knew little about Chris Klein, the owner of the Duncan mine, when we asked. Do you have any understanding of his safety and environmental record? Um, I. I'm not sure that that would be something that um, that government would be looking at. I'm not clear on, 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 on that, I have to be honest, because we look at who's involved in the day-to-day -day management of the mine. If he's not involved in that, I'm not sure about that. Safety's number one. Never mind the production, but just make sure you got all your ducks in line. It could mean an explosion if you're not careful with it. promised from all of this. She blames this man who built the mine for destroying her property. His name is Chris Klein, a coal magnate who's been dubbed the king of coal. Klein made some of his money by leveling mountaintops to heaps of gravel and extracting the coal inside. Maria sued the coal company that ran the mine behind her hollow. Chris Klein promised his employees and our county prosperity from his mining operation. There is no prosperity, nothing but poverty and, and anguish and broken bodies and poisoned land. In fact, his mine violated the law while it was in operation. Spadaro testified for Maria in her case against the coal company. The true cost is being came onto her land and wanted access to a piece of her property. And it all washed away with Chris Klein's mess. They planned to build a strip mine behind the family's hollow. And that worried her grandfather. Me and men didn't come in here for nothing, he said. They come in here for a reason. He said, he called me sissy. He goes, sissy, I don't know what's going on. He said, but it's going to be a hard fight if they come in here on you. Maria was determined to keep all her land, and that's when her battle began. I ain't afraid of nothing. And uh, I told him, I said, there's nothing here for sale, nothing. And they ain't, there's nothing here for sale. You can't put a price on it. But Maria couldn't stop the man from going around and working the land behind her home. Their prize was the coal. Good evening and welcome to 16 by 9. On May 9, 1992, a deadly explosion ripped through the Westray coal mine in Plymouth, Nova Scotia, killing 26 miners. Lax safety conditions were blamed for the tragedy, triggering tough new laws and promises it would never happen again. Fast forward 24 years and another coal mine is about to open in Nova Scotia. It brings the promise of much needed jobs, but as Gil Shohat explains, the mine also brings back bad memories and concerns about the safety record of the American coal baron who's behind it.
the soil of this place is pretty much my ancestors. I, I mean, the graveyards that, that lay at the top of our mountains are, that's my ancestors that lay, lay in those graveyards. My family initially settled this valley during the forced removal of the Cherokee. Uh, the women and children in my family followed the rivers to their headwaters. My family has been in this valley since the 1700s. Maria Gano's people have known these mountains, ravines, and ridges for generations. My grandfather's full blood Cherokee. Uh, he didn't talk a whole lot, but when he did, people listened. <laughs> and they upset him. Uh, my grandfather spent his last days worried about what they was going to do here. Maria says everything changed in 2000 when a mining company was buried near the top of the mountain. Like in other places in West Virginia, they stripped the hills bare and brought heavy machines that ripped tons of earth off the land and pushed it into the valley. They also built ponds meant to hold back the debris. Those ponds failed. We got a four inch rainfall and it nearly washed me and my children away. Maria Gano uh, was supposed to be protected. She was downstream. Jack Spadaro, once a top U.S. government mine safety official, is now a critic of the industry. When the water hit that uh, slope of that fill, it just washed everything out, uh, destroyed Maria's barn, almost uh, destroyed her house. Maria says her land was left befouled and polluted. Where is the prosperity that was 